friends, colleagues, students and visitors, welcome to the Melbourne School of Design and to this special lecture by our first ever Tresseter Fellow, Professor Greg Lynn. My name is Julie Willis and I'm the Dean of the Faculty of Architecture, Building and Planning. And I begin this evening's proceedings by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which this event is taking place, the land of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and pay my respects to their elders and families past and present. Tonight's special lecture has been made possible thanks to a very generous donation to the faculty. Creative Futures, supported by Professor Darrell Legrew and the Londis Dr Robert Tresider, has donated $1 million to the faculty, the largest ever donation to the Faculty of Architecture, Building and Planning at the University of Melbourne in its history. This generous and transformative gift has provided us with the means to establish the annual Robert Garland Tresider Fellowship. The Perpetual Fellowship will enable the faculty to bring internationally acclaimed design and innovation trailblazers to work in residence at the university. We are extremely proud and excited to have Professor Greg Lynn take on the role of the first Tresseter Fellow, and we are forever grateful to both Robert Tresseter and Darrell Legrew for facilitating this unparalleled opportunity. Please now join me in welcoming a welcoming alumnus, supporter and former Dean of the Faculty of Architecture, Building and Planning, Professor Darrell Legrew, to say a few words. Uh, thanks, Julie. I, I, I hate the formalities and Robert Garland, uh, Tresseter, I don't really recognise him. I know Bob Tresseter and he's sitting, sitting down here. Um, uh, just a, a, a quick overview. Um, Bob has been in the design education uh, theory and practice business for a long, long time, as long as I have, and that's going back quite, quite, quite a while. Uh, he was Professor of Design here at the University of Melbourne State College of, uh, of Victoria be before that, then again at Deakin as Professor of Design and Director of the Institute for the Arts there. Uh, then he did, did uh, a most unusual thing. He disappeared from the academic world and appear reappeared as the Director of a small very elite, and I don't mean that in a, in a pompous kind of way, but a, a elite and very high quality private design college, not-for-profit design college, located in South Melbourne, um, the Australian Academy of Design. Uh, it was a, it's a, it was a, a wide-ranging design school from fashion at one end to creative animation at the other. In fact, the creative animation of people won a, a, a Hollywood Oscar for the work that they did. Uh, so the, the work was incredibly good. So good that people um, from other, other climes wanted to um, a piece of the action. So we wound up mo moving the college on to a Can Canadian group and in return for that uh, re received uh, some money. Um, a, a lot of that money has been put into the fellowship here tonight. So the Robert Garland Tresseter Fellowship is actually honouring Bob Tresseter for the work that he's done over a long period of time. And the point is to help the MSD um, to recognise that um, design is actually the third way in our view. It sits somewhere between the STEM disciplines, the, the, uh, the, the science, technology, engineering, medicine, uh, mathematics and medicine dis disciplines on the one hand, and the HAS, the humanities and social science dis disciplines on the other. It has its own body of theory, its own, its own literature, its own uh, its doyens, its own, its own high priests and disciples in much the same way as those meta-disciplines do. Uh, design is ubiquitous. Uh, everyone designs every day in their own particular way. But at the high end of the spectrum, at the theoretical end of the spectrum, we also wanted to attract to the Melbourne School of Design people of the calibre of Greg Lynn, those who are making a difference at the cutting edge, those who are taking a step outside the, the, uh, the, the blackness, into the blackness, off the edge of the rim of where our knowledge is, into that black area where you actually require courage uh, as well as knowledge to uh, make, make a difference. Um, so th that's the point of the Tresider Fellowship. Why the MSD? Uh, not just because I happened to be the, the dean at the time, but because the corpus of colleagues, of academic colleagues, of students, of practitioners, of everybody who one way or another contributes to the MSD represents possibly the widest spectrum of 
design-oriented people anywhere in this country, and the MSD stands tall in the global network of scholars, practitioners, theorists, and others interested who, one way or another, have something to contribute to design. Um, we were also impressed uh, by the idea that the Melbourne model, the capacity of, of students and staff to work across the disciplines, across the faculties of the university, that this was a, a, an exciting, a, an exhilarating uh, prospect for undergraduate students and for graduate students to work in, in, the, in this way. Um, and to some extent, it, um, it ma marries with the University of Melbourne's broad initiative in the world of this discovery. This university, as with others around the country, but possibly slightly more, and that's reflected in the, in the ranking of the university, is about, is about discovery, inventiveness, invention, innovation, um, and that, the challenges that go with it. So these were the reasons why uh, because the MSD stands above the others in the country, the investment was here. Uh, it's also um, vital to, to think about uh, the reasons why Greg Lynn is with us as well. And as I was thinking about this, I was reflecting back on the whole business of morphology, which reaches back into, um, into Greek times, into the, into the great Greek theorists. But um, and I was thinking I brought that forward to the late 19th, early 20th century with Darcy Thompson, the great anthropologist, uh, who was incredibly interested in the way in which form uh, is transformed over uh, periods of time. Uh, and his work in, in marrying, trying to marry that with, um, with the theories of evolution, that had, of evolution that had come out of Darwinism. Uh, so the two working together, Darwinism, uh, and the natural selection on the one hand, and the forces of transformation of form and, the fo and, and forces of transformation of structure that went into all of this. And I think in there lies some of the underpinnings of Greg's work and others who have been working in fields like that as well. Um, I was also reminded of um, Fritz Zwicky, the uh, Swiss uh, astrophysicist, who said, within the final and true world image, Everything is related to everything, and nothing can be discarded a priori as being unimportant. And I think that also characterises Greg Lynn's work as well, that taking the steps out into the unknown also recognises that everything that we know is related to everything else. There are no norms necessarily. The norms are, th are something that we impose on, our on ourselves. And so, um, we're thrilled to introduce uh, Greg Lynn to you this evening as the first Tressida Fellow and look forward to the um, presentation tonight titled Fast Forward Animate Form, F-O-R-M. And as many of you will know, Greg is uh, uh, the founder of uh, Greg Lynn Form, F-O-R-M, the founding director uh, of the Architecture and Design Form. Firm. He is also currently a professor of architecture at the University of Applied Arts in Vienna, a studio professor at UCLA, and of course he was previously a professor at ETH Zurich, and all of those um, schools, one way or another, have a connection to the MSD. Greg pioneered the fabrication and manufacture of complex functional and ergonomic forms using computer numerically controlled CNC machinery. The buildings projects, which include uh, buildings, furniture, uh, city ideas, yachts, uh, all measure of things. His teachings and his writings associated, associated with his office have been influential in the acceptance and the use of advanced materials and technologies for design and fabrication. As design opportunities today extend across multiple scales and media, his studio Greg, form, Greg Lynn form continues to define the cutting edge of design in a variety of fields. His work is in the permanent connections of the most design and architecture oriented museums of the world, including CCA in Canada, the uh, San Francisco Museum, Museum of Modern Art, the Art Institute of Chicago, and the Museum of Modern Art itself. And he was the winner of the Golden Lion at the 2008 Venice Biennale of Architecture. Please join me in welcoming the first Tressida Fellow to the University to the MSD, 
Professor Greg Lynn. Thank you. Thanks so much. It's a real honor to be here, and, and it's been a pleasure the last couple of days. Um, I was asked by my good friend Don Bates to bring a range of material, and I know at least that I will have achieved. Um, I thought I would start off um, with pointing out a mistake I made. And, and in the late 1990s, um, I wrote this book, Animate Form, and it was a little bit of a response uh, to a whole range of things happening in architecture with digital design. There were some of my colleagues that were building interactive environments, uh, which I think now the Internet of Things was being cooked up by architects um, and, and some artists in mostly Northern Europe. Uh, also at the same time, there were a lot of people looking at making buildings that would move. Um, actually, Mark Goldthorpe, who was here um, at, at a very important conference in Geelong at Deakin University called Morph. Uh, he had the very first ideas of the hyposurface wall that moved. And, and for me, I was more interested in designing in an environment which was animated, but not arguing that buildings should move and not arguing that buildings should be interactive. Now, that was more to carve out a space I have to say now, uh, 28 years, no, 18 years later, I realize I made, I made a big mistake excluding some of that, and am now going full circle and looking at all of those things. And I think it's just important to say to the students that architects very early were defining the world we're living in now. They just happened to abandon a lot of those problems like I did. And I regret the fact that I abandoned the problem of dynamic buildings and I abandoned the problem of interactive buildings in order to focus on, I would say, a more conventional approach. Um, and it took me a little bit of time to loop around and come back to that. But so in animate form, I, I used a mo the model of a boat hull. And, and I'll just read it. Um, the particular form of a hull stores multiple vectors of motion and flow from the space in which it was designed. A sailboat hull, for example, is designed to perform under multiple points of sail. For sailing downwind, the hull is designed as a planing surface. For sailing into the wind, the hull is designed to heel, presenting a greater surface area to the water. A boat hull does not change its shape when it changes its direction, obviously, but variable points of sale are incorporated into its surface. So I was very interested in how to use dynamics for modeling things that were static. And I think you know, the very first piece of animation software I used was for this Port Authority gateway. But here you see all of the principles in action. I modeled a dynamic space, which was you know, a sketch of how traffic was moving on the site, and then ran an animation which placed components in space in a pattern uh, which evoked that motion without literally moving. Um, shortly after, with the Korean Presbyterian Church, the, the idea was, again, a conventional one where the rhythm and dynamics of architectural surfaces and components would make a space which was dynamic and had motion, like visual and spatial motion. And that motion was in the rhythm and orientation of all of the components. Um, I think it's also just worth saying that uh, only architects, when given a new tool, would find a way to make things more complicated. And uh, by stepping outside of architecture into furniture, I remember Rolf Fellbaum, when I proposed a chair that was made out of tens of thousands of parts, said that that was the stupidest thing he'd ever heard in his entire career of working with designers and architects. And I was devastated. But it, it actually pointed something out to me that in a lot of fields, 
the, the desire is to take a, a part or parts and reduce the part count. It's to make one thing perform multiple functions rather than having multiple things perform one function. And innovation is frankly about making fewer and fewer things higher and higher performance. So, and, and that's a thing that I think it's worth saying that architecture is having to do now. That it's not, digital technology is not about making things more complex anymore. It's about using less material, making things higher performance, building them faster, transporting them in a way that uses less energy. It's really a, a, it's a mandate now that, that our products have to become more high performance. Okay, but having said that, yeah, I went through 10 years of making things as complicated as possible, um, all through the use of robots. And so in this example, you'll see stationary robots for fabricating components. Um, in this case, uh, I was taking toys that my kids had had and scanning them and reassembling them and finding how they intersected with each other and translating that into paths and then programming robots to cut all the components and to make these incredibly complex assemblies. This is a fountain at the Hammer Museum. You know, the, the blob wall, which was really about thinking about masonry and brick in a way um, that, that was robotic. But again, you know, I was really striving to build something out of as many intricate components as possible and make it as difficult as possible to put them together just as a challenge to see what could be done with digital technology. And I don't think I was alone in that. Um, but it's a particular aspect that's probably germane to architects for, versus other people in other design fields. Um, at the same time, I have to say, I was often moving towards shells and surfaces. Here, I mean, this is even, uh, this is the mid-1990s. We did this thing called The Predator with the sculptor Fabian Marcaccio and the Pretty Good Life showroom. And certain kinds of things, I was starting to look at shells, which had structural properties of their own and didn't actually need um, complexity. In this case, like uh, this was after the meeting with Rolf, it's a, a tea set for Alessi where Roberto Alessi told me that in the brief that architects never put handles on any of their products and people always burn themselves on architects' products for the home. And he invited maybe 18 or 20 of us to do products and he said just make sure to put handles on. And so <laughs> Um, so I made it all handles. So the, the form of the, of the pots is all meant so that you can grip it ergonomically with your hand. And inside of all of those, there are vessels that are insulated with silicon so the surface doesn't get hot. But we made it this, I was very proud of the fact that we made it out of nine sheets of superform titanium. So instead of a lot of parts, these were very few parts, but the parts were performing not only holding the pots up, also insulating, and also being the handle. So it was kind of all, hand, it was 100% handle, um, instead of having a handle stuck on. So this desire to remove handles was a theme through the whole lecture, actually. Um, and then this is the response to Rolf Fellbaum, where I made a chair that was just in two pieces. So if normally a chair has a back and a seat and arms, uh, the, the ravioli chair has one contoured soft surface. Um, it, wasn't, it was Vitra that brought it to the project, but it was all knitted with a three-dimensional knitting machine, which now is the same machine that, say, Nike and Adidas and everybody's making shoes out of, but it's a zero-waste process. So you're not taking flat material and cutting it and templating it and sewing it together, you're actually just taking a reel of, of yarn and knitting it, and then when you're done knitting, you just cut it. So there's zero waste to it. And it's a three-dimensional textile. And then the bottom of it is 
the first thing I ever made in composites, which is a fiberglass shell. So it's two parts that fit together and make a chair. There's a little bit more than two pieces involved, but the, the concept was a two-piece chair. There's maybe half a dozen in there that go into clipping it all together and everything. Um, I scaled that up in the Bloom House where the, the clients wanted a house which seemed impossible. They said, we want a one-room uh, ground floor that needs to be really cozy. And it needed to have lots of wall space for artwork, um, but they also wanted lots of curves. So uh, what we ended up doing was taking the two party walls um, that were just kind of the maximum setback of the site and trying to integrate the fireplace, the bathrooms, the, the breakfast nook, a home office. Everything was all swallowed up into these undulating walls. And the same thing in the section, we changed the elevation of the ground floor to give a little more intimacy to some of the spaces and then brought that into scale with a, a glowing lantern, um, which we also then built in composites. So this is the, the exterior and the interior of the house. So you can see it's this one room um, space that has a living room, a dining room, and a, a kitchen and an office in it, but all open to each other. And it's modulated by that uh, hanging luminous ceiling. And all of the components in the house or off the shelf, like the fireplace, but they're swallowed into this one single surface. So rather than celebrating uh, lots of details, all the details here are attempting to be swallowed up into one surface. So um, for me, it was really about making a kind of a, a high performance surface that was very ergonomic in terms of where you sat and how you were in the room. Um, also, the, even the handles in the cabinets of the bathrooms and the kitchen were eliminated. So instead of having you know, fasteners that you would attach to pull, we just molded and deformed all the surfaces so, so the surfaces were compliant to your grip, but it was all just made out of sheet material. The, all the built-in furniture, like the kitchen island, the, the breakfast nooks, the, you know, the beds, and then in particular in the bathrooms. Those were also all molded out of Corian in these monolithic surfaces. And again, all the poles and handles and mirrors and everything are all swallowed into these surfaces. So it's really a house with two walls, and all the furniture in the rooms are just made out of bending and curving those two walls. So, this shift from, say, the Korean church, where it was all about maximizing the number of components, from my experience in the ergonomics of furniture and, and kind of things you grab and grasp, like housewares, it, it pushed me to start thinking about architecture in terms of kind of high performance, do the most with one surface you can possibly do. OK. Same thing, this is a, a dermatology clinic we did where all the, all the spatial modulation of all the exam rooms and everything is all swallowed into these single curvilinear rooms. And with all of these things, these forms are achieved, not, not exclusively, but with composites. So these are all kind of super components that were built off site and brought in. Um, actually, the bathrooms in the Bloom House were built in one piece and then cut, chopped up so we could get it into the house and then glued back together. Um, and you don't even see the joints. But so all these things are getting to be very big super components that are light enough that you can fabricate them and move them in in one shot. And it really changes the way that, that I started to think about structure and construction. So. Um, in terms of starting to use composites, like we did at the um, Site Santa Fe Museum, it's all about how you orient textiles, like fibers, in this case very lightweight carbon fibers, 
and place them in a very bespoke fashion. So the, the kind of absolute limit um, of structure and weight for us was using these North Sales fiber tape placement machines. And this is a machine that lays down tapes of carbon fiber, which is the, the lightest um, ply of, of carbon fiber there is. And the reason that's so is that three plies of that fiber can make a surface. And so for sales, they want those sales to be as light as possible. I mean, I realize in Australia, I'm probably talking to an audience where hopefully 90% of the people know about this or own it already. But this kind of a, a material is super lightweight and it, it has the carbon and the glue already pre-impregnated in it. And you lay it onto a mold and then cook it under pressure. And this is something we did for the Art Institute of Chicago, we were, where we were commissioned to make these hanging chairs, which you know, each one of these chairs weighs less than six ounces. And the carbon one, on New Year's Eve, we had three full-grown architects in it. So you know, 250, 300 kilos in it. And all of the, 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 the spectra and dyneema that it hangs from is all just bonded. So the only thing in it is just glue. So it's glue and fiber. And the fibers are all laid down with the machine that I showed you in the orientation of which the loads are, are flowing. So the, it's a very high performance structural surface. I think it was kind of um, inevitable working with these primarily marine materials. And, and I think that there's a reason that the marine materials are so attractive to architects now. It's that you can get near aerospace grade construction at about a 10th or 20th of the cost. And it's starting to approach the cost of conventional building construction, doing things in composite. And I think there's a lot of innovation going on right now about making buildings lighter so you can build them more quickly, so you can uh, get rid of a lot of loads and kind of exponentially reduce material. And also so you can start to achieve kind of higher performance um, interiors and exteriors. Because of that, I, I kind of went full circle and went back to that quote um, from Animate Form and decided to start looking at computational fluid dynamics for design. And along with a naval architect, Fred Kurubla, and uh, Long Beach State University, we, we, started, we designed this boat for myself that couples uh, fluid dynamics in air and water. So what you can see is the streamlines in the air that are moving over the sails, which is what produces the, the force. And then where you see the hulls in the water, you'll see pressure um, gradients. Uh, red is where there's a lot of high pressure, and then green is where there's no pressure. And this was the first time Anybody, and for a reason, this is the first time, anybody ever tried to couple air and fluids together into one model? And it was very much like the old days of sending something to a rack of computers and then waiting a week for it to do a calculation and seeing what would happen. But we spent about six months optimizing the design uh, for this coupled air and water flow. Um, the one thing that we didn't model, which I'll talk about later, is a driver. So every simulation always ended somehow like this, because um, <laughs> nobody was driving. Um, <laughs> we, I mean, we learned a lot about every single um, run that we would do. And, and what we were doing was um, shaping let's say, the, the forms of the hulls so that they would have an optimal shape for how they would move through the water. Uh, we were also shaping the surfaces to have minimal drag through the air, because the speed of the boat, actually, air drag becomes a consideration. And we were also um, looking at how much power the boat could have, meaning its, its width and writing moment. And it's a boat that foils, so it, it has appendages that go into the water and generate lift. 
So we wanted to make that sure that lift was being located in the right point of the boat so that it was as stable as possible. So um, these are, this is the aerodynamic drag. So what we would do is we would load a model, have 60 some odd computers crunching the data and giving us a report back with the simulations that, that I showed you. We would then revise the design and go through that. And we did that for six months, every week more or less, going through new iterations. So it was not interactive. Um, but all of the forms were influenced by this dynamic analysis. And again, nothing changes shape, um, but it's optimized for uh, a dynamic environment, let's say, than just drawing it on a, in a static screen. For me, the, the most exciting moment, other than when we dropped it from a crane into the water, was when the materials were delivered. And so what I'll show you was all built out of this amount of stuff, which is a pallet and a half of rolls of carbon, uh, two 55-gallon drums of epoxy, and that one pallet of foam for the core. So out of that amount of material, granted it's very expensive material, but it, there's not much of it. And so out of that, you can get that, um, which, and, which is actually less per square foot than an average house, something I keep telling my family. Uh, <laughs> so, and the reason is that it's, it's mostly air, it's mostly volume, and this, these are all high-performance shells. Um, the way it was built uh, is that we manufactured large um, recycled foam uh, molds. So this is the one half of the main hull being cut on a, on a gantry that has about a, I don't know, maybe close to 30, 35 meter um, length that it can cut. That's it being tipped up. Um, those molds were then finished, um, you know, pretty simply. And then those were the, the tools with which we laminated then the skins for the construction. So there's one skin of carbon, again, uh, with all of the, the kitted, so all of the loads are located in the planes in which the, the load paths move. We used uh, a lot of 3D printing on it. Actually, I picked the most critical and dangerous component on the whole boat, the connection between the steering and the rudders. So all the rudder arms and the quadrants are all 3D printed nylon with carbon reinforcement. What would have been aluminum parts, even with a 200% factor put on top of them, uh, ended up weighing about seven pounds. And in aluminum, they would have weighed about triple that. Um, the, the, the form of the boat is, is, as I said, optimized for two things. One is a very Spartan interior. So certain lines on the hull are just to maximize the, the width down below. So that there's kind of two bunks and then an aft bunk. And then those bunks, the, the curve that those bunks rest on lifts up for the galley. Um, and you end up getting a, a chine, the upper chine is based on the interior volume, maximizing the interior volume while minimizing the wetted surface in the water. The second chine is there so that when you go through a wave, the water gets projected out rather than on us while we're sailing. And the third aspect of it is that as the, the height of the hull increases, the volume of the bow gets very fat. And that's because this is a boat that when you're sailing, it doesn't tip over sideways. What happens is um, you always go twice as fast as the wind. So if the wind is behind you, uh, it actually feels like the wind is in front of you because at 10 mile an hour wind, we're going 20 miles an hour, so it feels like 10 on our face. And if you hit a wave and slow down, that wind that was in front of you comes around behind you and starts pushing you. And so the boat doesn't tip over this way. One hull goes in the water and trips, and you flip end over end. So 
The way you keep that from happening is you'd make the top of the hulls like a big balloon. So when it trips like that, there's all this reserve volume that helps you pop back out. And then when you pop back out, you want the very top of the hulls to be like a knife. So it's really easy for the boat to get back up because you don't want to be standing on your nose for long. So thankfully, I don't have a video showing you that in operation. <laughs> but I do, you can see the kind of hydrodynamics of the boat. So that chine there, which is where the, the berths are, it's never in the water, and you can see as the boat is in and out of the water all the time, that second chine is helping spread the water, and you see that kind of knife edge at the top of the hulls, which is to help us get back up out of the water when we trip over the hulls. I have to say the, the greatest thing is, and it has, a, has like a bass fishing motor on it. It has like a little four horsepower electric motor we use to just get off the dock. Um, but otherwise, it has no motor, no engine, uh, you know, a battery just to run the instruments. And otherwise, we put the sail up and, you know, we go 30, 35 miles an hour all the time. You'll see in a minute, there's a powerboat that's kind of struggling to keep up with us. <laughs> and, and also, you know, I wanted to make the, you know, I wanted to bring an attitude to the boat which a naval architect wouldn't bring to it, where all of the components are, are integrated. And so the, if I can, let me see. So say all the pedestals for the winches, all the mounts for all the hardware, all of those components were integrated into those shell surfaces. So there's a very small number of components on this boat compared to a normal boat. And I have to say that, you know, Fred, the naval architect, the builders, everybody was skeptical that we'd run every line in 3D and worked everything out. And they said, well, it's just not done that way. You know, you just build the boat, you do all that on the dock before it'll never work. Um, but it was all, you know, very thought digitally and resolved digitally um, to produce it. So, you know, because of designing a projectile, which that boat is, is a projectile, meaning it's a, it's a thing that doesn't change shape but is meant to hurl through space. Uh, I started thinking about what it would be to have building components that would not be projectiles but actually would start to move. And with Christian Moeller, um, we entered a competition in London for a, a pavilion, a moving pavilion, where we proposed having three 1,500-pound uh, capacity robots on columns that would be able to manipulate and move a carbon fiber dome uh, on the site. And it was a very quick proposal, but it got me starting to think about building components that would move and things that actually would move and, and transform in space. Uh, I was asked by the Cordrick um, Building Fair to build a small domestic residential unit. Uh, they asked it to be a 60 square meter uh, studio apartment. And so I had this idea of having a 60 square meter apartment that had these three plans. And I think you'll figure out in a minute how it works. So this is a, a living space. That plan is of a kitchen, and that plan is of a bedroom. And the way I got those three plans in one space was to come up with a living unit that was, you know, this shell that you could rotate into three positions. So horizontal, vertical, and then horizontal on the other side. And that all of your furniture would be like a gimbaled piece of furniture in a boat. So what was up on your ceiling might have been your bed and nightstands. And on the underside of it, it's a lamp. And so you can see here, uh, this is with the living room on the ground and the bed and the nightstand on the ceiling. And all of that stuff stays gimbaled so nothing spills or, or you know, falls as the house spins in three axes. Now, this was for a building fair, obviously. I, I wouldn't, 
I would live in this, but I don't think this is the future of housing. <laughs> um, no, I mean, it's not meant to be like the, you know, the, the new model for, for residential construction. Um, but what we did do is we, for the first time in my office, and this was just like, it says 2015, so just a couple years ago, it's the first time we ever built an interface to move something that we had designed. So you can see we, we took this, uh, it's, it's a program called Touch OSC for um, mostly people that are DJs use it for programming. But we built a little interface and built a miniature robot to move the house and roll it 360 degrees in plan and then 180 degrees in section with some presets and then also the ability to manipulate it. And we did that for the, for the building fair. And then we scaled it up to one-fifth the size that it would actually be and built it as a carbon shell that was light enough that we could move it around and then built a small one that had the, the furniture in it. But for me, what was important was building that app and building an app that would move a thing in space. And um, this ended up at Facebook for about three months and uh, also at Red Bull for a couple of months. And then all of a sudden we got a call from a company uh, called Curbside. It was very interesting. They said, um, we got your name from this rolling house and uh, we are a company that's at the intersection of the digital and the physical. And we think that you could help us with our architecture. And I said, okay, uh, you know, what does that mean? And they said, well, we're turning cities into fulfillment centers. And what that means is they're, they're a company that is rethinking um, brick and mortar retail and trying to compete with Amazon. And so the, the way this, this works is you go shopping on, your, on a device, you know, on a, on a phone or a tablet or a, a computer. And if you want to buy, a, you know, a scented candle in Melbourne, it'll tell you where the scented candles are within whatever radius you're willing to do, say 20 miles, and you buy it. And a curbside employee or an employee of the store pulls that out of stock and puts it into a bag. And if you buy things from a Westfield shopping mall, they'll run to all the stores and buy all your stuff for you and collect it into a bag. And you know, they have now about 2,500 installations in the United States that are freestanding, plus 4,000 CVS pharmacies. So they're, they're getting close to having 10,000 points where you can pick this stuff up. And each one of these points will have anything from a, a post, which is a small landmark to know where to stand to have somebody meet you, all the way up to a pavilion where they store a lot of the goods, and, and that's near your car where you drive up. <coughs> In these stores, there's an actual person that goes and picks the stuff based on what you've ordered. They collect it and bring it out to one of these structures and the structure contains in it a mast, and in the mast is a lot of proprietary technology, and they, they call you on the phone every hour or so to just know what cell tower you're close to. When you get within three miles of your stuff, they turn on aspects of your phone, things like Bluetooth, and then when you get close, they know through Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, and your cell signal where you are down to a centimeter. So you pull up with your car and they meet you and give you the bag and then you drive away. And for the building departments, they always want to know if we're increasing traffic. And so we had to tell them, look, we're not even parking here. <laughs> and they, they said, we'll prove that. And so uh, I went and called some lawyers and started to put together an architectural proposal to go respond to the city planners. And before I even had the proposal together, they had asked all their uh, sales associates to download, to take videos of all the transactions. They put those videos onto a computer. The computer ground them all down, and they found out it was an average of 13 seconds 
for every transaction. So the, a car would stop for 13 seconds on average before they would get fulfilled. So what this company is doing is turning shops into fulfillment centers. So instead of building these buildings and filling it with stuff and then trucking it into cities, they take a city, catalog all the inventory, and then do online retail for you within the city and within the shops and the malls. So for me, the key aspect of this, and in and, and these posts now, we're getting them so they not only move, but where we have multiple ones, they'll change color. So your telephone might turn red, and the place where your goods are will ha also have a red post, and so you'll know which one to drive to. Um, but what's, what's key about this is, and we were talking about this today in some of the seminars and lectures, is what they call localization, what, they, what we call localization. What that means is that um, you know, if you have phones, those phones are now beacons which let the world know who you are, what you've been looking at, where you've been traveling, who your friends are, where you live, where you work, and it also lets you know who all the other people are that are around that phone. So environments now, uh, primarily outdoor environments, are able to localize you in space and know what you're near. And that's transforming the entire civic realm. So anymore, it's not so much what address you're at or where you are in a building. Uh, you know, the world it has access to knowing all of that information about you. Um, and this is an example where architecture transforms it, I think, very much like an ATM. You know, it goes from being a big building that's a bank getting more atomized and smaller, more dispersed, and more intelligent. And it's, it's for me, changing the way you think about cities, transportation, uh, and for sure, location. So this theme, you know, and, and just also, by the way, for their headquarters, we did all their interiors and composites. Um, <laughs> but it's a move towards things that are more intelligent and that are taking more and more data and trying to make that data more personal, but also more connected. Um, another example of this is uh, some chairs that we're doing in collaboration with Nike for the National Basketball Association, for the NBA. And, and here we're really making a microclimate. So, um, that's John Hoke. He's about the size of the professional basketball player this was molded on. But these chairs are all molded to have a maximum amount of contact with the players. They're all built with that carbon fiber I showed you, so it goes from rigid to flexible. But more importantly, they're covered in sensors and temperature-changing Peltier chips. So, uh, where you see those areas, this is the kind of first generation, there's a series of chips that if you send them a charge, they heat on one side and cool on the other, and if you want to cool somebody down, you just flip the charge and then you can cool them down instead. And these chairs are covered in these Peltiers that are then mounted to heat sinks to dissipate the heat if they're cooling on the, on the player side. They're embedded in the chair, and then the chair can, can pull the heat signature off the player and then condition the player to increase their performance during the game. And um, that was the first generation. The, the second generation chairs were doing, uh, we actually found out all basketball players are kind of the same size. <laughs> we thought <laughs> they're all like, you know, a little bit taller than me, much fitter. Um, but, but we actually don't need to make them custom for each player. But so these are some of the, the ergonomic studies. But, but what we're doing is piloting with three NBA teams, both on the sidelines, um, at their training facilities, and in the locker rooms. And really what we're doing is, uh, is cooking them as much as possible. So when they come off uh, the court, even for a minute, 
if we can keep them hot, they go back out and they don't cramp up. And there's a lot of players, you know, players that are making 30 or $50 million a year and they're not able to play in the fourth quarter of a game only because they come out for a minute or two and cool down. So this gives the, the players a distinct performance advantage. Um, it also lets, lets the coaches and the trainers take a lot of data off the players during the games to know kind of how they're performing. And I, I think in the future you'll also see on television a lot of data on individual players being um, available to fans. So, um, and these players are very hard to get a hold of. So what we do is we download, there's, there's I think, I forget how many we had, maybe 20 some players are the real elite level ones. And they're all fully scanned down to sub-millimeter accuracy. And we average all that. We kind of throw out the outliers, like the really short ones and the, the centers that are really tall, and come up with a kind of average player dimension in about 100 different um, measurements, and then build a 3D scan of that and, and rig it. And then we're able to pose characters in the molds and in the chairs. And this is an example of us using um, HoloLens, which is a mixed reality device, to take those players in 3D and place them on a chair and examine where the fit, fit issues are, and also look at where we need to put heating and cooling components on the players. So that's, I think that's actually me walking around, looking at a physical foam tool that we then use to make carbon fiber shells. Um, architecturally, we did this at the Venice Biennale of Architecture last year. That's, uh, that's Wolf with one of the hollow lenses you, you kind of pinch to navigate. But on top of that model is all kinds of metadata, the history of the site, comparisons of building precedents, all that you can overlay in 3D um, and see. I think here's a little... Uh, capture, this is what Microsoft did to kind of show the, the technology. But so you'll see you open up a menu that floats over the model. You can drag down precedents. You can um, go through a menu that shows you what the history of the site was and how it developed and which buildings had been demolished. We had a report on all of the buildings on the site. So you can bring all this metadata onto physical things um, it also changes the way I'm, I'm sure people are going to be building. Finally, um, I want to just show two things. I think this, um, this approach to localization means that there are going to be some new building typologies. I've been thinking a lot about factories lately. And one is a factory that we're renovating in... Uh, in Mondello on Lake Como, which is the Motoguzzi factory, where we're thinking of a whole visitor experience and plaza which moves seamlessly indoors and outdoors and does it without um, needing to have a lot of physical boundaries. And it does it with uh, some little robots I'll show you in a second. But each one of the, the components is visible to the visitors so that the visitors can experience the factory and go see their motorcycles being built or just tourists that go to Lake Como thinking it's a great vacation place and getting bored in a day, have a place to go and you know, see motorcycles get made. And that entire factory tour complex all happens through a kind of indoor outdoor tube where if you see those little spheres a person in a sphere, like a little robot, get to get led around through the factory and get information on, on how the motorcycles are being built. This is a kind of HoloLens view of that, of that visitor experience, like floating in my office. And again, the, the critical thing about this is localization. So again, even at the scale of a model, I can take a digital file, modify something, put on a lens, and then that lens doesn't have GPS. It actually sees the physical model, 
and matches the digital model to the physical model because of the way that it's seeing uh, and, and building a map. And so the last thing I'll show you um, is a result of, of this thinking about localization and mapping and thinking about things that move, in this case, robots that are mobile. And so this, uh, that's the designer of, of R2-D2 with his little R2-D2 model. And about uh, a year and a half ago, um, Jeffrey Schnapp and I co-founded a company dedicated to rethinking cities, uh, not from the roadway, but actually from the building and sidewalk, and trying to think about how, in a place where you can't get an autonomous car, and where you don't want or can't get an aerial drone, where we could start to provide mobility and transportation to people uh, at pedestrian speeds. So um, this is all trying to solve the, this problem, which is that you know, China is being designed for automobiles right now. Um, cities that are trying to solve problems through autonomous vehicles are gonna find, much like cities that said, if we just make bigger freeways, we'll have less congestion. And lo and behold, what they got was more cars to fill all those more lanes. And it's the same thing happening with autonomous vehicles and even ride sharing right now is there's more traffic on the streets because of Uber, because people are circling around waiting to pick up rides. It's having the reverse effect on decongesting cities. So instead of trying to find smart autonomy for roadways, we're trying to think of ways to find smart autonomy for sidewalks and also smaller vehicles that'll be more efficient. So this is an intersection in Hanoi. The video runs about a minute. So in that one minute, there's 120 two-wheeled vehicles. There are five cars, and I think there's about a dozen pedestrians. Now, if you put those 120 people on scooters and bikes into automobiles, even if you put five into every automobile, it's a traffic jam. So Southeast Asia has figured out how to go back to roadways, and I'm sorry I didn't bring them, but roadways back when there were horses and carriages, where you had multimodal traffic happening on roads. You had uh, pedestrians, you had carts, you had horse-drawn uh, carriages, all occupying the same space at a very high density, lower velocity than an automobile, but high density. Um, so if the sound works, it's a little bit of a corporate video about the company we set up but it actually captures everything we're doing in terms of pedestrian cities. He is a, a company started in order to put together different cultures and people. We want to understand which are the new needs of young generations. Because we come from Piaggio, we see cities in a different way than an automobile company. We think about people moving in a granular way. Granular mobility is a concept that um, we have elaborated within Piaggio Fast Forward to call attention to those spaces that we navigate as pedestrians, as citizens of the 21st century city. We thought, let's try to make a product which engages all those different cities and the way people move in all those cities. Chito was designed to leverage the power of human navigators of urban spaces to make sense of them. We imagine it as a kind of Vespa for the 21st century. Jita is thought to help the human, from a young kid in the school to an older one in a hospital, for instance. It's a total fusion of, of the two technology. It's a land drone, it's a cargo bot, it's a Sherpa, and it's a smart device that learns the environments uh, and maps them as it travels them with human guidance. It moves as slowly and can maneuver the same as a human, and it can move as fast as a human can run, and everything in between. It can also comfortably carry about what a human can carry. Jita has two main purposes. It is thought for goods transportations, for people transportations, and to mix them to help people. And we see a future 
where city streets are not full of autonomous cars, but people walking, jogging, riding on lightweight devices like skateboards and bicycles. We believe that the 21st century will be the century of robotic movability. So in the, in the last 18 months with Piaggio, which is the company that builds the Vespa, as well as owning brands like Aprilia and Moto Guzzi, we've developed this uh, lightweight, uh, intelligent robot. And it's a robot that uses autonomy like a self-driving car, but instead of navigating and avoiding people, what we're doing is we're training it and teaching it to know how we move. So it knows how a person moves, it knows how children move, um, it, and it primarily follows and navigates with people in pedestrian-rich environments. So it can move through a crowd, it's made for sidewalks, and I'll show you a little bit of the navigation. It, it does everything without signals, without a GPS or a Bluetooth. It, it looks around, it builds a physical map, and it sorts out who the people are versus who the fixed things are. And, and well, I'll just show you how it works. Um, before that, this is a little bit of vision of how we think this is change, gonna change a city. Um, and you'll see that the, the vehicle is meant to follow people in both pedestrian modes as well as things that we ride, like bicycles, skateboards, wheelchairs, that it's, it's meant to move like a vehicle, but to do it in pedestrian rich spaces. And here I think. Oops, sorry about that. Um, I think the obvious market for this is uh, if we wanted to be in the back of a warehouse or a fulfillment center, or if we wanted to be delivering goods. But honestly, we're targeting a consumer market for this. So we really want these to be things that people use in their everyday life, not things that are doing jobs for people. And you can see there's, we have different sized ones. That thing we call Kilo, which carries about 400 pounds. The smaller one carries about 40 pounds. For me, this is where being an architect is important because the roboticists, the venture capitalists, um, they look at things called pain points, like how do you get the pizza from the car to the front door of the customer? And that drives technology innovation right now in Silicon Valley. But we're thinking about the city, we're thinking about how people could be social, um, personally, I don't want my kids to be sitting in the back of a self-driving car, sitting there looking at their screens, interacting with their friends. I'd rather have them walking down the street with all their stuff following them and be able to see what's going on and talk to people. So that civic attitude is forming every technology decision we're making. So we're not, I mean, we're doing a lot of innovative stuff, but we're not really inventing autonomy in the same way that the car companies are. And again, we're focused on, on people. The way we do that is through mapping. So these devices don't know where they are in space with, with a GPS. They actually look around and build a map as you walk. So if the environment changes, uh, it's not a problem for them. This is what they see, which is about an inch of the world at kind of knee level. All those little, all the dark blue things are what it's sorting out as physical barriers. All the light blue are moving things like legs. And it, it's just looking for legs. I mean, we're teaching it to look for legs all the time. So you can see number 402 is who it's following. And all the other legs, when it detects two things moving in a way that looks like the way people walk, it puts a box over them and names them as a person. And um, that's how it's able to navigate through crowded spaces of people. It's just always looking for those two legs um, and following without colliding. 
So that's kind of what the machine sees. It's also very interesting, when we started, we were programming these uh, robots. Now, we actually just train them. We get millions of pictures of, say, kids, and show the robots millions of pictures of kids, and it then learns what a kid's legs looks like, and then when you put a kid in front of the robot, it knows that's a kid versus an adult versus a dog. Um, and it, I gotta say, with our team, it's pretty impressive how I can say, can we get one to follow a dog? And then a week later, it's following dogs. Um, <laughs> but it's not like we're programming it. We're just showing it stuff, and it's learning. So this, this world of machine learning, um, is not, it's very real. Okay, so that's kind of how it navigates. Um, again, from the architectural perspective, I'm trying to tap into the thousands of years of moving with things that we already know. So all summer long, that's my dog Harvey, I've been bringing Harvey, but you know, I've been looking at, at this world, you know, the world of the bird dog, the horse, and the falcon, which are all things that extend people's territory and all things we move, we know how to move with. So for instance, um, we taught them how to follow each other, too. That was actually pretty easy. Um, but so when we were teaching them how to follow each other, you know, uh, again, there's a few architects on the team. Everybody wanted to have them be a swarm or some super complicated thing. And, and so I brought in a cowboy. And we worked for a couple days with the cowboy whose life is bringing supplies to the fires in California with mules, because they're not allowed to bring anything with a motor. And we said, is there ever a situation where the mules would be like a swarm of bees? And the guy just laughed hysterically. He said, no, they're a line, they're a train. You know, that's, we go through cities, we go through mountains, we go through pastures. We always have the mules in a line. They're happier in a line, they're easier to navigate in a line. He said, the only time they're not in a line is when he knows a couple of them are gonna die because they're on the side of a mountain that's unstable. And he said then he spreads them out because he doesn't want all of them to go down. He just wants to lose one or two. But he said other than that, you just make lines. So we made lines. Same thing, we've brought in falconers, uh, people that handle birds that send things out and have them come back and deal with line of sight and the distance that you can see things from. And so we're trying to learn from this deep history of people and animals how to be in close proximity to a robot and how to teach that robot to be with us in cities and spaces. So this is the distance. This is for us what autonomy is. Autonomy is not send the thing out and have it bring you back a burrito. The, <laughs> you know, autonomy for us is being able to, instead of getting in your car to go a kilometer away and bring back a case of wine or groceries, to be able to make a decision to walk or ride a bike. So we've been building tools to help us. Our really hard problems are actually like holding a door open for a friend or being courteous. You know, it's, there are certain times where following won't get us uh, where we need to be. So this is a tool that we've built where we motion capture people walking through doors and going through vestibules, walking through a rotating door is a nightmare. Um, but like the courtesy of holding a door, we have to figure that out for our robot. <laughs> so, so we're also, you know, and we're patenting all this. So our company is a company that knows how people move and understands how people move with each other and are able to plug autonomy into that whole ecology of mobility in the, in the cities. And again, only an architect would actually think of this kind of stuff. So they're made for carrying predominantly. They, there's not really a precedent for how to let somebody know what's going on when these things roll around. Um, so we're doing a lot of, of testing and iterating in terms of you know, light and sound, and both for the person that, that's interact, that the robot is moving with as well as for people in the environment. We want to indicate how fast it's moving. So there are LEDs that signal the odometry. We're playing with having it, you know, the lights turn red sometimes on the surface it's going to be stopping that you might walk into. 
we're trying to figure out how these want to communicate um, you know, with people. They're all carbon fiber, super high performance. And, and they're all engineered by vehicle dynamicists. So they go, you know, right now they'll go over 20 miles an hour um, and they stop and start like a person does. So they have a lot of control authority and balance. So it's not like a little, like a beer cooler on little wheels. It's actually more like a motorcycle. Um, yeah, we're 3D printing all the stuff. That's the big one kilo. And then here's just a video showing some of, of where, this is from about three months ago, kind of where we're at. And this vehicle is called Gita, which means short trip in Italian. Um, but so it's able to follow a person in a crowd. Right now it's following Vinesh, who's a guy in the black t-shirt in the front. I mean, you can trick it. Like if somebody's malicious, you find a lot out about a person actually when you... <laughs> I would say about a quarter of the people that we get followed, the first thing they do is try to mess up the robot before they even get followed. <laughs> but so it's able to avoid people and replant its route. And then we've even got it, you know, following people on bikes and skateboards. But, but again, this is really not meant for, I mean, it can go on the road, somebody, it's gotta follow somebody. So it's, it doesn't have what they call level five autonomy, like it's not gonna make decisions about when to cross a street. Um, but it is able to follow people, you know, this again, it's an older one, we're, we're you know, on a weekly basis increasing the performance and, and navigation of it. This is just pretty sweet, these kids. Um, I have to say, it's, it's great for people with mobility challenges. <laughs> yeah. These, by the way, these kids aren't the malicious types. They just all want a chance to get followed. <laughs> but you can see it's struggling to get to the girl that it's following. And, and it's not something where you're on your screen all the time. You walk up and touch it, it looks at your legs, and you just go. And then when you want to stop, you touch it again, and it stops. So um, we still, like getting it through doors and things, we're these higher level behaviors where it can't just follow, we're working on, but this is not something you drive. The whole point is it's autonomous. You're not driving it, you're just walking. Um, but again, it's not something that's meant to avoid people. It's something that's meant to be with us and in pedestrian environments all the time. Okay, thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Greg, for the most extraordinary lecture. Um, you have always been at the, the leading edge of design, um, and you have just proved to us that you still remain very firmly at that leading edge. And what a wonderful way of seeing what the power of design can be in, in revisioning the future of, of how we will live, but a much healthier, happier future, um, which is great to see. Um, we would like to take this opportunity to invite our Robin Robert Garland Tressida Fellowship supporters and representatives of Creative Futures, Dr. Robert Tressida and Professor Daryl LeGrew to the stage. And please also wel welcome back uh, Professor Greg Lean to the stage. We're going to make a short presentation. So. so we are honored to officially present the Robert Garland Tressida Fellowship to Professor Greg Lynn. Thanks so much. <laughs> really an honor. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thanks. Well, you, you should be standing in the spotlight, not me. Um, so you're, uh, I will read what I've got here. Um, your outstanding design innovation is truly inspiring and there was nobody more perfectly suited to be the inaugural Tressida Fellowship. So we have had an extraordinary event tonight. I thank you all for coming. Um, it's been very special, so please enjoy your evening uh, and have a very safe journey home. Thank you very much. Thanks so much. Really an honor. Really an honor. Oh, good. Good, good. <laughs>